good morning. Thank you for coming to this session <laughs> early on. And I would like to thank the organizers uh, for uh, this opportunity to present our work and to make these collisions between chemists, biologists, uh, medical doctors, physicists, very interesting. So uh, yes, I, I would like to, to talk about the other aspect, which is more uh, uh, towards the diagnostics application, especially rapid detection. And uh, OK, it works. Uh, <clears throat> in our group, uh, we are working on nanomaterials, uh, and we want to make them visible. It's very important to, uh, for, for several aspects. Uh, to, to visualize, especially in the optical up to output, our nanocarriers and what we can do with that. And uh, for example, uh, we have two types, main, um, two types of nanomaterials, polymeric nanoparticles and lipid droplets. Polymeric ones, for example, uh, are, as they are known drug carriers, uh, we are striving to, uh, to be able to um, to follow at the single particle level uh, their behavior in vivo. We, use them for uh, labeling cells and then tracking multiple populations of cells and different colors. And uh, 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 the topic I will be focused a lot on is in biosensing to use those particles for, for making rapid uh, screening assays. And the lipid particles, uh, uh, we are interested uh, also as a drug carrier, which is a kind of uh, complementary synthesis system to liposomes because it, they contain the oil, oily core. And actually, we, we set up a system to monitor the integrity of these nanocarriers directly in vivo using optical output. Uh, so I will focus today about polymeric particles. And in, in fact, fluorescent nanoparticles in general, there are many. And we are interested in polymeric ones because, in fact, they, first of all, they are uh, potentially uh, promising drug carriers, but uh, we can also make them very bright because we can load the particles like uh, people load with drugs. We can lo load them with dyes, and when you put more than 100 of dyes, this becomes a really bright object. They can, you can uh, track it at the single particle level up to in vivo. And uh, so, uh, what are the challenges in polymeric nanoparticles? Uh, uh, you also could notice there is a lot of talk talks about importance of small particles. And small particles are important uh, not only for delivery, but also for imaging, especially for imaging. And here we were introducing a concept of charge control nanoprecipitation when we put a few charges to the polymer, and then we can get particles between 5 and 30 nanometer. And then the, the other aspect, when you try to load the dyes into the particles, and when you put a lot, they self-quench. And so here we were proposing uh, a concept of using uh, a bulky contrarine, which separates the dyes from self-quenching and helps to load. So that, that helps to create really bright objects. And the final challenge uh, is to make those particles working for sensing. And because you have so many dyes inside, and we want that a single molecular recognition event turn on and off the whole particle, which will give you an amplified response to the target. So how we make particles, it's actually uh, quite a simple protocol by uh, mixing a polymer with our dyes in organic solvent with nanoprecipitate, and then we obtain particles of uh, controlled size, and in fact, independent of the dye loading, when you use this magic contrarine, we can load a lot and keep the same size, and then uh, the brightness increases with the loading, uh, which is important, which is not the case when you don't use this contract. Like this, you can get particles between six and hundred fold brighter than quantum dots. And quantum dots are very bright particles, so those are much brighter than that. And the size could be varied like between 15, actually between seven and 50 nanom nanometers easily. So what you can do with that, and uh, uh, the first applications uh, were with particles which were not functionalized. When you give them to the cells, they can internalize. And then we, when we make particles of different color, by combining them in different proportions, you can actually create barcodes inside the cells. And so, for example, we could uh, uh, stain, uh, um, code six different types of cells in six different color codes. And when you mix them together and co culture for, for days, you can track them and recognize them individually. And you can do more. You can, for example, make spheroids and track six different populations combined together in the, uh, uh, in the 3D cell culture. And then the, uh, you, you could track their migration. Then you could inject them in vivo. Those are cancer cells, six different cell populations. You can imagine uh, cells which were treated with drug a different amount or knockouts, different genes, and you mix 
though they inject at the same time, and you can track them directly in vivo. So, uh, and the other uh, uh, interesting thing that I, I was saying is that uh, people uh, ask the question, how nanocarrier behaves? Because we always look, look at the result of the treatment, but uh, we don't know where is the nanocarrier, where it goes, and how it liberates. And here, we want to address the question at the single particle level and track the nanocarrier directly, particle by particle. And here, for example, in collaboration with uh, Igor Kalin and Plisnila in, uh, in, uh, in Munich, uh, we are doing intravitreal imaging and adding those particles uh, injecting them in mice and then uh, making their imaging of brain, of live mice. And in fact, uh, when you look in the blood circulation, you could actually see the individual particles circulating. And pigulation was, of course, important to keep them uh, alive for some time, uh, circulating for some time. And uh, so, but today I want to uh, focus more about the point of care diagnostics. Everybody hear about it. This is something that could, in principle, revolutionize the, the, the future medicine when you can detect markers, very complex markers, in a one shot very rapidly. And here the fluorescence is very interesting because there are so many devices existing up to the smartphone, actually, uh, you, uh, where in principle fluorescence is fast, you have molecular specificity, you have many options for detection. But how about sensitivity? People say fluorescence is sensitive, but in fact, it is sensitive when you're using a dedicated microscopy systems. Then you can detect single molecules. But when it comes to a simple detection, it is not sensitive enough. And with the usual machines, fluorimeters, or those uh, um, portable devices, you are getting 200 uh, to 1,000 nanomolar concentration, which is not relevant, for example, for detection of RNA uh, uh, markers or proteins. So we need much lower concentration. That's why people need to do amplification with PCR, etc. So uh, w where is the problem? And the problem that we, we use organic dyes for detection, and they are not bright enough. So how about these our particles, which are much brighter than dyes? So for that, we need to trigger molecular recognition event with the response of the particle. And the most common way is to do FRET, first resonance energy transfer, so where you conjugate donor and acceptor, and then when there is a molecular recognition, there is a switch in the color because donor and acceptor separates. And actually, recently, we address, uh, the, the problem is that this works for molecules, but for particles it doesn't work because particles are too big. And FRET works at five nanometer distance, and particles more than 10 nanometers wouldn't work. And here we actually introduce a concept using our particles, and we obtained, uh, using a light harvesting concept, we obtained the so-called giant light harvesting nano antenna, which gives you uh, amplification of the signal because thousands of dyes respond to this, uh, uh, to, to, to FRET actually to a single acceptor. And uh, this amplification is actually higher than plasmonic nano antenna system, which is a very hot topic actually now, which needs much more complex configuration. So that was very promising. So now we need to make them uh, detecting some biomolecule, particularly RNA. So we couple our light harvesting concept with their concept of sensing based on hybridization. And so here, expect to get something bright. And, and what is our target? We selected mRNA, a cancer marker, uh, survivin. Why it's interesting? Because it has diagnostic aspect as a marker because it's anti-apoptotic marker. So it's responsible for, for instance, for drug resistance uh, uh, because cells don't want to go to, ap to apoptosis because of it. But on the other hand, uh, when you detect, you also can produce silencing. So you can actually uh, make cells which are resistant, uh, you can transform them to cells which will be prone to apoptosis. So you can combine therapy and detection, and so you can get something more, more personalized and more efficient. So, so this would combine sensing and, uh, sensing and silencing. For that, we need to uh, build a sensor. So our sensor based on FRET. Once, uh, when this sensor is built, you have FRET. When target uh, hybridize with our nucleic acid, the acceptor goes away, and our particle changes the color. For that, we need to functionalize our particle with nucleic acid, and that was not an easy task. And for that, we develop a polymer, which actually assembles and presents uh, azide group at the surface. And then, uh, uh, after <laughs> trials and errors, we were able to modify our particle uh, with a controlled number of nucleic acids. 
And uh, so when you increase the number of those acceptor uh, uh, sequences of nucleic acid, you have FRAT, so that was perfect. Important, just a few hybridizations I needed to control the color of this particle. And when we compare it with two molecular probe, you need 2,000 fold higher uh, 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 but, uh, to amplify a signal 2,000 times to compare it with our nanoprobe. So it is about 2,000-fold brighter than the molecule. And then, uh, does it work? Yes, it works for detection. So this is our sensor with a thread. And then you add the target, it displaces our uh, acceptor and the color change. If you take a sequence presenting mutations, it doesn't work, so the response is very small. So it's sequence-specific, that's important. So how bright is this object? So when we, uh, to, to study that, we need to deposit it under a microscope. Or, uh, so we, on the glass slide, we can hybridize it with, uh, with complementary sequences. And so we, those are individual particles. And here are quantum dots amplified 25 times by the laser power, but they're still less bright. So they're about 100 times less bright than, uh, than our uh, DNA sensor. So, uh, now, how does it work? At the single particle level, we detect donor and acceptor, and then when we add the target, the acceptor disappears and donor uh, remains. So the color switches. And in fact, the response is dependent on concentration, and the limit of detection is 0 0.25 picomolar, which is really quite low, uh, low, low level. But important, the single particle detects about three, four nucleic acids. Uh, per particle, which is actually uh, uh, exceptional. And it works in uh, serum, for example. So this result is, I think, the uh, important step towards point-of-care point uh, um, uh, chips development of point-of-care assays. So, and the, finally, when we want to do detection and, and uh, silencing, we are not yet there, but when we add those DNA particles to the cells, we observe actually that already after 10 minutes, we have them inside the cell, and you can see them moving fast inside the cell, which is actually quite astonishing. So it's a good step towards our goal. So in conclusion, uh, we, uh, we established different concepts to obtain very bright and small particles. We developed their surface chemistry. Now we have some biological application like barcoding, tracking individual carriers in vivo, and then based on light harvesting concept, we developed biosensors, which is important. And so uh, I want to thank my group, and uh, especially Andreas and Nina, who was involved in DNA project, other people who, of course, contributed to uh, other, uh, other aspects that I was talking about, and collaborators, especially Igor, uh, Kalin, who is present here on the in vivo tracking, and ERC Grant, of course, who uh, support a lot of the research. Thank you for your attention. Thanks a lot for giving us a bright future. <laughs> Any question? Can you use the microphone over there? Thanks very much for the talk. Um, uh, just a question is related to one of the last slides. Uh, when the pure particles uh, enter the cells and you say they're moving quite fast. Yeah. What is that? Is it Brownian movement or is it microtubule dependent or is it active transport? What is that? Yeah, in, in fact, uh, for the moment, uh, we, uh, we suppose, uh, because the, the motion is totally random from what we observed, uh, but we need to do tracking analysis. We will do it, but at the moment, we know what we see is that it's a Brownian motion, which is expected for just random walking in the cytosome. Right, yeah. No, it's just simply, I've, I've got some doubts in relation to that, because uh, uh, it's, not, it's not just uh, water, it's, not, it's a viscous. Oh, yeah, 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 there is so, a lot of... So to see the bronium motion like that in, in fact, the viscous, the, the in the viscous media. The cytosol is organized, so it's a not Well, water. that's what I mean, and so that's something why, else. Yeah, yeah, there are organelles, there, is, uh, yeah, there are lots of membranes, and uh, so they had to follow some paths, but it's not a directional movement, it's, yeah. it's uh, restricted motion, let's say. So are you planning to study this as well? Yeah, 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 yeah. Good, good. We Thanks. actually study this Cheers. now. Yeah. Good luck. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Any more questions? Okay, so one from my side, how stable is that material? Because you want to put it into a device. Yeah, so in fact, uh, uh, for, for diagnostic assay, the stability is not the main issue, but for cellular explication, of course. And uh, in fact, if it, as it is uh, uh, PMMA-based, so it doesn't hydrolyze that fast, so it will 
it will remain there for, let's say, for a month. But stability in salts, for example, that has to be adjusted because it's charged particle yeah. with many uh, uh, nucleic acids. So, but we notice that when we put more nucleic acids on the surface, the stability of particles is higher, actually. Okay. Yeah, this actually was shown also by Mirkin uh, group uh, for gold nanoparticles. The more you put, the better it will be stability. So okay. DNA helps. Yeah, okay. thanks a lot. Thank you.